Hello. Hello, Ben. Um, I'm Julian. I feel I know you haven't met me yet, but uh, I've been the one messaging you. <laughs> Great to meet you. I'm yes, excited for... to come on. Yeah, it's um, I've been hyping you up because I really respect everything you do. <laughs> Um, in terms of what, what you do for the football terrace when you go on, you just you speak so well and you're very informative and you and I just I have so much respect for you. And obviously you work for CBS Sports Galazzo. So and I know you're on you talk a lot about the Premier League. So I do have a lot of questions about that firstly, uh, it, when it comes to Juventus. But I want you to have the floor right now just to explain what you do and what your day to day is with CBS Sports. Yeah, of course. So CBS Sports, we're the rights holder for Serie A and also the Champions League. And my role is as a journalist. So I yeah. cover a variety of stories across our digital output. We've got the website, we've got CBS Sports HQ, which is like a rolling news channel. And then, of course, we've got the live games, particularly around yeah. Serie A. Excited to be covering Juventus. We've got the Champions League. They're in that as well, of course. So there's a lot really of news breaking of original storytelling there's some writing there's some broadcasting it's a very diverse role but naturally during the transfer window things pivot a little yeah. bit and we start chasing off one or two stories the thing that i always enjoy is when you get like time with an athlete and when you don't have yeah. to rush so the transfer window is the complete opposite it's crazy it's bonkers things are changing within a matter of seconds whilst we're on this broadcast 10 or 12 different things will break. But the good thing from CBS's point of view is we've obviously got an American focus. So therefore, yeah. what we are looking to do at large is either celebrate the platforms that we've got, like Serie A and the Champions League, and therefore, if there's transfers around that during this time, we'll follow them as best we can. But if it isn't those leagues or the properties that we own, we've got an American focus. So Chelsea's been very big for us yeah, during absolutely. this transfer window. They've got brand new American owners. So that's the kind of day to day. It's diverse, it's varied. But as I always say, 10% you see on Twitter, and then 90% is the actual day job. So everyone yeah. judges what they see on Twitter, but it's such a small part of what we do. For sure. Um, I was going to say that even further, like you spoke to Juan Laporta this year from Barcelona this summer, correct? I saw that interview, and I, or that, yeah, that interview. I saw you go behind the scenes at the major Premier League clubs like Man United. You went behind the scenes in Chelsea. Um, just how awesome is it to be able to speak to these professional players? Obviously, I, I, I'm not at that level at all. So it's just, are they, I, I guess I want to ask you, what are they like behind the scenes? Well, I think, first of all, don't put yourself down. Nobody is beneath chasing after a footballer or an interview. That's the yeah. beauty of <laughs> journalism. You create, you connect with people, and then through that, you develop relationships. They take time, obviously. And one bit of advice I have to anyone, whether you're chasing an interview or you're following after a story, is just it is all about those relationships. So if you're in the middle of a window and you would like a story, then if the agent doesn't know you, if the sporting director doesn't know you, then they're not going to give you anything, just cold calling. And therefore, you spend actually the time between the windows when there's no pressure and perhaps they're more open to having face-to-face -face or getting to know you, building up trust. And then 99% of what you discuss with a senior person at a football club has got nothing really to do with a transfer. Because if you're the person that's just asking every single minute, day, hour, week, whatever, what's going on, then all they see you as is somebody that's kind of circling around them rather than in their circle. And that's the key difference. And then yeah. when you meet a footballer, it's in a variety of different ways. So we have something called a mix zone, which is the interviews that you see immediately after a match. Then we have the obligated media responsibilities, which are organized by the leagues and the federations, particularly for a rights holder like CBS. And you might get 10 minutes with a name. And then you get the more in-depth interviews that perhaps you've got control over nice. and you can organize. And really, a footballer is exactly that. They're a human being. They often have a completely different personality and outlook than you think. They often don't match the playing style. And of course, the bigger the name, the more in demand they are, perhaps the more media trained they are. And your task as a journalist is to try and get something original and the best out of them. And then once again, it just comes down to relationships. So. 
a footballer shouldn't be seen as a superstar. They shouldn't yeah. be seen as someone that's not accessible. If anything, we're moving in the other direction and we're seeing more about the human side and the personality away from sport than we have ever before. And I think that means if you're young, if you're a creator, if you're a fan even, you can have that accessibility and that connection in a different way before because you may learn you share the same music taste. Yep. You may learn that you share the same socially conscious cause or the same mentality around life. And when you see that, that's a new connection. Whereas perhaps 10 years ago, it was all just, why do I like a footballer? Because they score goals. They become a superstar. I don't really know them. Everything I see is through football only. And therefore, I'm a bit starstruck by them. And I think now we just know so much more about the bigger picture of them as human beings. And that connection is both good in the sense that you've got more ways that yeah. you can actually engage with a footballer. But of course, it means that due to the demand of the fact that they're doing TV, they're doing radio, they're doing yeah. online, they're doing or they've got their own platforms, there's a bit of a disconnect as well because they're busier than ever. So it's a really interesting state of play. But my advice once again is don't be starstruck and don't be put off going yeah. for a football interview. Quite the opposite. Always try your luck because footballers, football clubs, agents and so on, they can only say no. Yeah, absolutely. That's some good advice. Um, transitioning it, like going off personalities and whatnot, obviously Juventus have had some players that have been linked to Premier League clubs like Adrian Rabiot to Manchester United. Do you have any insight as to why that just never happened? Was it was it due to fans and blocking it off uh, to their owners, or was it just because um, his mom Veronica or Veronique was just demanding too much? Yeah, I think it was a mixture. The agent demands, which, as you say, is via his mum, were very, very high. And that obviously put Manchester United off the deal. And Rabio was not sold on a move to Manchester United specifically, yeah. unless there was a scenario where he was going to be ably compensated. So the player has a lot of control there because they're not saying, I'd like the move. And if possible, the terms can be preferable. What the player is actually saying is, I'll only take the move if the terms are preferable and the terms that he wanted were just very, very high. And Manchester United prepared to pay big money in wages, but only for the right kind of player. And that, I suppose, was the frustration against Rabiot from Manchester United fans, that if they were still in for De Jong, wages are not a problem. If they go in for, as they then did after this saga, a Casemiro-style player is exactly the position that really adds to Manchester United. But I think the challenge really with Rabiot is just whether or not at 27 years of age, he would be worth it for the fit that he would have into the Manchester United team. And I think that that was certainly what meant that fans didn't get as excited about yeah. him for and then I think the other factor is just that you've obviously got a player that even though he is known for his time at Juventus recently and PSG let's not forget he started his youth career or had a part of his youth career before he eventually ended up at yeah. PSG's youth academy at Manchester City so yeah. he's also a little aware, albeit a slightly skewed perspective, a much younger perspective. I think it was back in 2008. He's aware of the mm -hmm. Premier League. He's aware of, the clubs a lot. He's aware of the culture. He's aware specifically of Manchester. And I think that was a factor in his decision making as well. He was only going to go back to Manchester, not from a football perspective, but a city and a culture and a league. And some players just like a certain climate. They like a certain lifestyle. They like a certain type of food. So when you are being asked to move and you're actually quite comfortable i mean culturally personally where yeah. you are then your agent's basically going to say you've got to pay the price and i think it's exactly the same with casemiro by the way that he's moved to manchester united it's a great fit and so on but why has he actually made the move well of course ten Hag, of course big club of course all of the other things like game time comparative perhaps to a, a rail where he'd be ever so slightly less of a focal point but money talks as well and he He's extremely Absolutely. well paid and I think it's exactly the same. He just turned around and said, listen, you either pay me the going rate or talks are going to break down. And the challenge for, I think, Manchester United in that deal is the way that they approached it. Because at that stage in the window, even though it wasn't like the very last day, it was still getting late in the window. Yeah. They should 
known what the wage demands were. So if they broached the deal, they shouldn't have been shocked by the wage. So that's kind of poor planning on Manchester United's part because you usually you do your due diligence. And if you get that far in a deal and you get a buy-in from Juve, you then would usually have confidence from the agent and player side that the personal terms are realistic and feasible. And in Rabiot's case, they weren't as Manchester United were concerned. Yeah, and you know what? I wish you were coming on two weeks ago because that was the answer we were trying to give people when it wasn't happening because we, we were, like, Juventus fans, we, are, we get frustrated with Adrian Rabiot, the way he plays, the way his output. We expect so much more from a player like him with his pedigree and whatnot. So it was just, we were very happy at the time where we thought he was being sold to Man United. And it's great insight from you to explain that very in well depth. Um, earlier though in the window in July-ish Matthias De Litt was linked to Chelsea and Juventus ended up selling De Litt to Bayern Munich for 67 million euros plus 10 in add-ons but when we see fees like 90 offered for Vardial 62 million for Cucurella and um, what was the Fofana I don't, what, what was the amount that Fofana went for 70? 70 million basically, yeah. yeah. So when we see those numbers and we see the amount that the lit went for, Juventus fans are probably want to know why Chelsea didn't offer more to begin with. I think it's just a mixture of things. It's context. So at the time that Chelsea were considering delete, they didn't really want a straight cash deal. So yeah. they were prepared to meet the overall valuation, but they were ultimately considering sending some players the other way. And Juventus yeah. have always had some form of interest in one or two Chelsea players, particularly Jorginho, and they may still revisit that in a future window. Koulibaly okay. arrived at Chelsea and Jorginho is a lot more settled now, but he was one of the names being mentioned. And then even though Juve never made a loan offer, they also explored Christian Pulisic a bit earlier in the window as well. So there was leverage and there were options there that potentially allowed Todd Bowley at the Chelsea end to get delete with more of a swap deal mentality and I think that that was of appeal but at that stage in the window Chelsea had not necessarily budgeted for the spend on delete because you have to again look at the overall picture so at that stage they were hoping to bring in two attack minded players and yeah. they'd got that sort of 60 to 65 million odd fee for a Rafinha style player who of yeah. course they had a bit accepted for but didn't get and then it was two centre-backs, and they also then thought that Aspilicueta would be out the door, so they may well have needed another full-back as well. So that's when you're adding up the maths and you're looking at the value and you're working out whether this is the right player at the right price. And then added to that is not just the price, but from Juventus' point of view, if they are to do business, what do they want the payments in? Do they want it in yeah. a small amount? large amount and are the add-ons gettable or not gettable so it's often about the structure of the deal rather than only the number that can put a club off and then of course there's just market value out there so if you're looking at delit and it's a hundred odd million euros and you know that buying are entering the race suddenly and it's going to turn into a bidding war and you also know that juve are not open to a player swap deal then all these things plus as i say at that time yeah to be clear not now there's the, we need two centre-backs, we need to replace Aspilicueta, we think Alonso's going to go, he has now gone to Barcelona, and we're probably going to have to spend big money on not one attacker, but two attackers, and at that point, that 100 million isn't feasible. So then if you flash forwards to, say, Wesley Fofana or Vardiel, with Fofana, it's a little bit less than that 100 million euros, yeah. and in addition to that, it's a long-term target that they've suddenly realised was available during this window. But by the time they get to Fofana, they're aware that Rafinha is off the table, they're aware that Aspilicueta yeah. has played, they've got Koulibaly in, who they also didn't think was that possible at the beginning of the window, and they've not paid a massive amount of money comparative to a delit. So suddenly the maths all adds up and you actually get Koulibaly and Fofana or delit. Give or take, like there's a slightly higher value on the Chelsea end than just the Delit fee. One's about 100 million quid, the other's yeah. about 100 million euros. But there's not a massive difference between those two. And you've got a two for one. And then suddenly there's that money to spare. And then you can yeah. move in the market for 
uh, Kukurea, and at the same time, they haven't yet got a player in that Rafinha mould. So maybe there's that 60 million of added budget that they can put on a different player in a different position. So that's why the context is key. It's not only about the number. You can't take a hundred million and say you wouldn't spend it on one player. Why do you spend it on the other? They might think one is that market value and one isn't. It's the timing that you do it as well. There's a lot of different aspects. And it's also, is it a hundred million or is it just hypothetically 85 million and 15 million and yeah, add-ons and, and how likely are the add-ons to be paid? So there's a whole variety of reasons why. And then with Vardial, you see the 90 odd million. It won't be possible in this window because he signed a new deal until 2027. Yeah. But you may revisit that one in a year's time. And again, why are they talking about it now? Because it's money that they don't need now. They can negotiate either for January or for next summer, but they don't need to find that money right away. So suddenly that might be their first spend of the summer window in a year's time rather than their last spend of this particular window, which means that they can afford it. Yeah, absolutely. Again, great insight as always. Um, it does put in perspective the timing of everything out and how it happens and how it shakes down, like you said. Um, staying with Chelsea and Juventus in particular, obviously we know Dennis Zakaria is going to Chelsea and we see the pretty big option to buy. What do you think? Do you think Chelsea will actually buy this player if he's usable at the end of the loan? I think it's so difficult to say without yeah. him actually playing a game and it works both ways as well. He has to settle at Chelsea and then vice versa. Chelsea have to assess and determine what they actually want to do as part of this particular. So all we really know so far is that it's a late swoop. It's important yes. to point out that from the perspective of Chelsea, up until lunch today, they were pushing really hard for Alvarez yeah. instead. And then finally, they realized, despite the fact the player didn't train this morning, that there would be no offer accepted and the Ajax weren't going to even accept 50 million. Chelsea bid 43 million English pounds and even 50 million wouldn't do it. So they had to turn their attention to Zakaria instead. So it's a season long loan. He's done the medical in Turin. Personal yep. terms were not a problem. And as you correctly say, Chelsea hold this option to buy. And I think that if... Chelsea get the player who starred for Borussia Mönchengladbach yes. then they'll have made a very good signing but if they get the player that has been at Juventus then it becomes very hit and miss and that's the yes. big difference that Zakaria made I think 125 appearances for Borussia Mönchengladbach and was consistent and was organised and had progressive passing when he needed to Absolutely. and had great intelligence and awareness off the ball and then at Juventus, he's been in and out of the side since moving to Italy. I think he's only played under 15 times in the league since his move. So what Chelsea are really looking to do is reignite a bit of a forgotten character. And then if they do that, it will prove a very smart bit of business. But the fact that he wasn't their number one target in this position, it tells you that they have reservations, tells you that he's probably going to come in and be a little bit of a squad player. And that is why it is only an option to buy and only Thomas Tuchel can answer your question at the end of six <laughs> months or 12 months. But the good news for Zakaria is that N'Golo Kante is injured and nobody really wants an opportunity because another player is injured. But Chelsea are screaming for a DM and the fact that he has moved is out of that necessity. There were definitely other positions that Chelsea may have strengthened. I mean, attacking midfield in the central area with obviously their pursuit of Frankie de Jong for some of the window uh, was probably that number one area that they wanted to try and move late in the window. But due to a couple of negative results, defeat to Leeds, defeat to yep. Southampton, and the Kante injury and Jorginho is still ultimately getting on a little bit as well. And Kovacic has only just come back it all transpires to suddenly realizing there's a hole there at the moment in the defensive or holding central midfielder role. And ultimately that's benefited the carrier coupled with the fact that Chelsea couldn't get Alvarez. So we're going to have to wait and see how this goes, but it's quite clear that there's a very good player in there, more proven at Borussia Mönchengladbach than Juventus. And if they do yeah. get the best out of him, and I think he fits Chelsea's system, then it will actually prove to be one of the smarter bits of business that Chelsea have done this summer. For sure, I agree. And he's also very, very good for his national team in Switzerland. Um, I have an Italian background, so I usually support uh, Italy. And when we had the two World Cup qualifiers, he was a monster. So last thing for you, because I know 
I know you're busy. You're a busy guy, and you need to do go. <laughs> but I know you're a Leicester <laughs> fan. Um, are you watching right now? Firstly, you got three screens going. <laughs> um, I do obviously have the game on. Yeah, how are they doing? It's no nil. No, it's no, not too bad. Okay. Twenty-one has gone. The best thing is actually that Tielemans started, which means that he's highly, I, highly likely to play at the football club. So that's good news. Yeah, and I was going to go there. Um, is it shocking to you that he's still at the club? I'm surprised nobody made a concrete offer. I yeah. mean, there hasn't actually been a single formal offer. There's been a couple of late inquiries. There's been a couple of verbal talks through intermediaries. But absolutely, you've got a player with proven Premier League experience that can get box to box, that can score goals, that can provide assists and has good numbers and consistency and is constantly improving on his skill set his defensive qualities and his athleticism. And those are the areas where to really play for a top club he needs to develop. So I think some of this is down to Leicester selling for Fana and then yeah. holding out for 35 million instead of under 25 million. And I think some of it's down to the fact that ultimately Tielemans divides opinion. And even yeah. though Arsenal would like the player, they're not prepared to pay over the odds because they're quite well stocked. And Granit Xhaka has actually had a really good start. Yep to the season so I think what we'll see with Tielemans is possibly a club like Arsenal coming back in for him next window um, so lastly the follow up he's in the last year of his contract do you think it's going to be a bidding war for him not necessarily a bidding war although obviously if it takes a year rather than January then he becomes free and yeah. at that point there would be far more suitors if there's still a fee of one would imagine under 15 million that Leicester would be asking for yeah. in January, then at that point, I don't anticipate a bidding war. And I think the other thing is it all just depends on Arsenal because if they revisit their interest in the player and make a formal bid, then Tielemans would pick Arsenal. Okay. And I think a lot of clubs are aware of that. If it's just a Premier League-based race, so then they would probably back off because they know exactly where Tielemans wants to go. But, yeah. you know, six months or so ago, Real Madrid were creeping in. And they've obviously got Chua Many as one of their midfielders. There's been a goal, by the way, in the Leicester-Manchester United game, and it's unfortunately gone to Manchester United. Uh, it's Jadon Sancho. So that's a little bit irritating. But I managed sorry to about keep that. my flow. <laughs> yeah. Manchester United are recovering well, though. Ronaldo on the bench as well for yeah. that game. But anyway, yeah, let's see. It's impossible to say. You can't predict that far ahead, but... Fundamentally, Tielemans will want the stability. His priority is not so much the move now as just playing regularly and in form in a World Cup year. Yeah. And then after the mid World Cup, I'm sure he'll revisit. And of course, if he has a phenomenal World Cup, then like your question suggested, that could prompt a bidding war. Yes. And similarly, if he doesn't do that well at the World Cup and is not as in demand, he might say to Leicester, I may as well sign a new deal now. And that will also depend where Leicester are in the league table too so there's too many variables at this stage to accurately unfortunately answer that question yeah um i really wanted him to go to juventus but i knew of the interest of like he wanted to go to arsenal so it's just a player that i've been following for a while um but with that ben thank you so much for joining uh we really appreciate your insights for all of uh, the juventus talk and just football knowledge in general i'm going to continue to watch you on the terrace and cbs sports Golazo. Um, if you guys have a chance, the people in the chat, um, take a look at his stuff, all of his work, and I hope we do this again sometime, Ben. And I hope Lester yeah, comes we'll back. <laughs> yeah, keep up the good work, and we'll Thank see you, you soon. All the best. Thank you. Have a good day.